Look in your Bibles, would you please, in John chapter 18, and uh, let's consider some things here. Today is Hello, My Name is Sunday, okay? And I see that the majority of you caught the memo. That's what the name tags are all about there, and so this evening we'll put them on again. It's good to be reminded of other folks' names. How many of you have a hard time from time to time remembering people's names, all right? And uh, as a matter of fact, maybe someday you'll want to wear your name upside down, name tag, so you can look and see who you are, okay? But uh, you know who I am, and I'm going to take this off just because if I don't, it'll drive me crazy that it's peeled up here today. We're going to approach a passage of Scripture very seriously and very soberly, not be in a hurry to get through it. I think that there'll be information here that will be a learning experience, but also I think that there is good application. And so if you'll allow me to, we'll go verse by verse here, and we'll consider some things from the point of view from a man named Pilate. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll go on. Father, now we need you. Lord, I desire that you would take these things that have been uh, seen and learned in study and things that you have moved in my life. And then, Lord, that I, in a a fashion that would be pleasing and honoring and glorifying to you, Lord, that we might be able to transfer them to your people. Uh, Lord, uh, such a sobering and such a, uh, oh, uh, mature thought. We do not want to take the, the death of our Savior flippantly. We do not want to make light of this. For this purpose, you entered into this world, and we recognize that. Lord, as we consider Pilate and who he was and what he was experiencing as well, may we in some way possibly even be able to relate to this. Lord, we know that what we do with Jesus is of eternal importance. And so now, Lord, speak to us. We ask in Jesus' name again, we pray. Amen. Uh, Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart, every word. God's people who know the Lord Jesus as their Savior should never grow weary and never grow tired of hearing Christ's story. It should stir our hearts. He is the captain of our salvation. The Apostle Paul, in helping to direct Timothy in one of the letters written to him, as the Holy Spirit would have him to, called this very expression of Christ and his confession before Pilate, He used it as a direct statement or command, even as a way of encouraging Timothy to have the right confession. And so today we'll approach this. I'll give you some groundwork of what has happened up to, and then we'll go forward here this morning together and perhaps even this evening. We've come to the last week of the Lord's ministry before Calvary. He's entered into Jerusalem, and he's entered in triumphantly. There's much that could be said there. The people have lined the streets. They've watched as he has descended from the Mount of Olives and he's come down. I've had the privilege of being in those places. And some of the stuff that they tell you about Israel, I think it could be very easily discredited. And uh, we do not worship a place specifically. But there are other places there where uh, just practically it would have to be nearly where you're standing. For example, the Garden of Gethsemane would just nearly have to be the spot general location for sure. And then there are very limited paths, and these paths, roads have been paved for years in stone. And so these very roads that Jesus would have traveled on, it would be very difficult to not be able to figure some of that out and to know that. So I've had the privilege of walking down that path from the Mount of Olives as you look to Jerusalem, which is up on a hill, but you travel from the Mount of Olives down this hill to the lower portion where the Garden of Gethsemane is, and then you begin to travel up And what the Lord Jesus would have seen in his day would have been the temple. Today on Temple Mount there is a mosque. It's in poor shape and falling apart. And hopefully someday it will just fall apart. But it is there on the top. And that's where Jesus would have gone to the garden and then been led up. And as he was traveling down and coming into Jerusalem, people had lined the streets and they were crying out, Hosanna. The word Hosanna just in a simple explanation is a cousin to the word Hallelujah. Where one is glory to God, the other is save us. We recognize who you are. Hosanna is save us, God. Help us, save us. As they're crying out, Hosanna recognizing him and taking him as their king and desiring that he would lead them as a nation uh, under his control and under his authority. They cry out and that happens. And then with just just a few days, uh, that same crowd that was saying Hosanna will utter those horrible Horrendous words of crucify him, crucify him. In the middle of all that, the Lord Jesus will go to an upper room where he'll take the Passover with the disciples and there will be what we would reference as the Last Supper. 
They would go from the Last Supper to a place to pray. The Lord Jesus would go there with the disciples and on the way he would speak to them and they would sing hymns and songs and then they would get to the garden and they would pray. Jesus would go, of course, farther than all of them and and inner circle. You know the story, Peter, James, and John were invited to come closer to him in his prayer time. But there in that garden is when Judas will come for the price of a slave. He'll betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be those who will come from the Sanhedrin. There will be those who are the captain of the Sanhedrin guard. There will also be Roman soldiers who will be involved in that. And the Gospels speak to this. And there are various things that would take place with that. Of course, you know that Peter would take his sword and would draw it and would swing and chop off the ear of one of these that would come to take Christ. And Jesus would reach down and put the ear back on that one. And Jesus went and stood before them. He'll have several stations uh, in what we would call a trial. He would first be taken to a person who was known in that area, and we see him in John chapter 18 and verse 13. Jesus has been led away, and he's been bound. Verse 12 says this, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Cephas, which was the high priest that same year. This fellow, Annas, was a man who had a reputation and had held position with the folks. He was an authority to them. And they started out at his house, and they've come in the evening hours. They'll go from there, and Jesus will come and stand before Caiaphas, who is the high priest, the designated high priest at that time in Jerusalem. He'll also stand before a group of people called the Sanhedrin. And this is the great Sanhedrin. Any time in Israel when there was at least 120 families, a, a system of courts would be formed much like what you and I have here today in our country. We have in our county, for example, we have county courts. We have in our city, we have a city court, and there are judges who are appointed by those in leadership. They would have small Sanhedrins or courts, if you will, all throughout Israel, but then there would be a great Sanhedrin. That great Sanhedrin would be composed of 70 people and the high priest, so 71 total. And they would be somewhat to speak the voice of the land or the judicial system for the land. They were the ones who were to uphold the law. They were the ones that were looked to. And much like in our country when we think of the lower courts and how things are kicked up to be appealed to, the upper court, the higher, or the great Sanhedrin would speak on behalf of all the people. And this was that Sanhedrin that was brought together. And this is the group of people that Jesus would stand before. So he was bound in the garden. He was taken to the house of an official. He was taken then from there to stand before the high priest and the Sanhedrin. And this happened at night. And then he would go in the morning, just as soon as they could, and they would have a third hearing for Christ, and it is then that they would condemn him, and then they would take him to Pilate, condemned. And there was method and reason behind that. We'll unpack it here in just a moment. And so here's our Savior now. He is bound. He's been snatched from a garden. He's been transported now from place to place where he has been questioned, where he has been tried, And we see him now being delivered to Pilate. I want you to go with me now, would you please, in John chapter 18 and verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Cephas unto the hall of judgment. The hall of judgment is a place that Pilate would rule from. Who was Pilate? Pilate was a person designated by Rome. Proctor is the term that was used. He was a person who was designated to keep control of a district or of an area. He didn't always stay in Jerusalem. Often he would stay in Caesarea where there was a place and a palace that had been built that would have been more to his liking. But on this occasion, he is in Jerusalem. And it's believed that in Jerusalem he would go to Herod's palace. They believe that they've actually found this and uncovered this very area and some of the foundation of it still in existence where Jesus may have very well stood before Pilate. And so the they that delivered Jesus would be all of those Jewish leaders and that Jewish court that has tried him now, and they brought him to Pilate, and they want Pilate to do something with him. I want you to notice the words here together. They led Jesus unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled. You read that, and if you don't put the thought into what we're talking about here, it's, uh, it's quite ironic. Because these are people who are defiled. They are holding on to a rule not given in Scripture, but one that they have established for themselves, uh, that leading into a Passover, they were not to enter into the home of a Gentile or into a place owned by a Gentile 
for fear that they would perhaps come in contact with something that would cause them to be defiled. And so they would not go in. So here's the picture. This crowd has brought Jesus to Pilate. They send Jesus into Pilate's presence. They stay on the outside of this building. Pilate now comes out to them and he asks them, what is it that you want me to do? The reason why they didn't come in is because they keep the rules. But that's such a scam. Because in the trial of Jesus, looking at this simply from a secular perspective, not you and I know who Jesus is. When we hear and see these things happen to Jesus, we say, how could they treat our Savior that way? From Pilate's perspective, Jesus was just another Jew, one that had been accused of things, one that he had heard things about. This crowd that has brought him in who have rejected him, they are showing him such poor treatment that they would not even show to others who were hardened criminals. Fourteen things have been violated in their own law and how they've handled Jesus and his trial. I mention this to you because you see their approach to not entering into Pilate for fear that they would be defiled. Do you know the truth of the matter is that the self-righteous man is such a scam. The self-righteous man, the religious man who thinks in some way that he could keep himself and prevent himself from being defiled and he puts on a display. This is what we see in the book of Ephesians. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. And these men stand outside Pilate's hall. They wouldn't dare enter in to a place where a Gentile was at for fear that they would be defiled. And yet that very evening, they have trampled the very rights that were established in their country for a fellow countryman, leaving out who he is. They have held trials in places that they were not supposed to. They were supposed to be done in public places. They were supposed to be an advance notice given. They were never to pass sentence in the same day. The judges were to sleep on things so that they would have time to consider it. This is why in the midnight hour they passed sentence or the evening hours, the night hours, and then the very next morning, as soon as they could, they woke up again to be able to go and take him to Pilate. They have not given him opportunity, if you will, to state his defense first. They've used bribery to bring accusation against him. They've had false witness against him. They have violated their own laws, things that are clearly seen in the scripture and things that we could with just a simple research look into the very laws that governed them. They are lawless and they want to do something. They want to silence Jesus Christ. And there's lessons here to be learned. A lesson to be learned is that people who consider their opinion, who consider their view, right, to be the right one, even if it's the wrong one, for the good of their perspective will violate the very law. Now listen, this is why we need to have a truth. And this is why we need to have absolute truth so that we can all be governed by the same truth. Do you know what you have without God, without Jesus, without the Bible? You have chaos. You have chaos whether it's the natural man living and just simply living to exist in his own way, or whether it's those who would be religious, consider the chaos that comes in when we do not have absolute truth and God's truth. And so they have now presented him to Pilate. Pilate steps out and says to them, look with me, would you please, what accusation bring ye against this man? We look throughout the Gospels and for time's sake will not take you. There were seven charges that at one point or another were voiced about Jesus. It was said of him in Matthew 26 that he had claimed that he was going to destroy the temple. And John, he's proclaimed to be an evildoer. In Luke chapter 23, he's accused of having per perverting the nation. He's accused of telling the people not to pay taxes. He's accused of stirring up the people. He's accused of presenting himself as a king. But finally, the charge that sticks, for which they will justify putting him to death, is blasphemy. Because Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 63 when he gives reference to who he is and his return and how that they would see him. When they hear that, they cry out and basically they say, see, he proclaims himself to be God. But that's the truth. He is God. And that charge of blasphemy according to Old Testament law would give them the right 
to put Jesus to death. And the death that Jesus would face would be the death of being stoned. This is something that we'll see Israel do in Acts chapter 7 when they don't like Stephen and what Stephen has to say. What do they do to Stephen? Very quickly, without involving the Romans, they run upon him with stones and they stone him and put him to death that way. But here, something's different. They come to Pilate and they say to Pilate, we want you to deal with him. Pilate says, what's the charge? And they said, hey, if he were not a malefactor, we would never bring somebody to you that doesn't deserve to be punished. So what is it, Pilate says, what is it that he has done? Verse 31, then said Pilate unto them, take ye him and judge him according to what? According to your law. If your law says that he should be put to death, if your law says that he should be judged, then I give you permission to judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. That was not a biblical thing. That was a Roman thing. There had been a law passed. The Romans had said to those of Israel that they could not bring capital punishment upon people of the, in and of themselves. That it was only for the Romans to do that. And so in a way, they're appealing to him and saying, Would you please be the one? When we look at this thing from natural eyes, we see what they're trying to do. They're trying to pass the buck. There are many people in Jerusalem who will not understand why Jesus is being treated this way. There are those who have cried Hosanna, and there are those who have been helped by him. And boy, you would want to become very unpopular if you're a part of the Sanhedrin. You want to become very much looked out upon, be involved in putting Jesus to death. But if you want to pit people against those who occupy you, let them put him to death. Pilate says, go ahead, you can put him to death. No, 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 it would be unlawful for us to do that. But here's the wonderful thing about all of this. Jesus came to die. God is bigger than all of this. Look at the next verse tells us. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. He couldn't be stoned by Jewish hands, for then the scripture that Jesus spoke would be false. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 32, if I be lifted up. And this he said in reference to how he would die. You see, the death on the cross was to be lifted up. The death of stoning was to be pushed down and heaped upon. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll do what? I'll draw all men unto me. Isn't that a tremendous statement, all men? That's where you and I come in, all men. You see, sometimes we look at life, maybe even now as we look at the world, and we say, man, look at all that's going on. Consider all the political posturing and all the political pressures in the world today. Not just here in our country, but around the world. Consider all that mankind does in the kingdom of man in trying to get their way and trying to pit people against each other and trying to accomplish the same goal, which is to silence truth, which is to stamp out the things of God. They work and they posture and they pose and they present themselves to be something. And they think that they're outsmarting. But God says, I know everything that's going to happen. He is going to be lifted up. This is according to my purposes and my plan. Hey, be a good steward of what you have. Be informed, occupy, uh, help where you can, and be engaged in things as believers because we are the salt. But let me remind you of something. Temper all of that with something greater. And that is that our citizenship is in heaven. This world is just a system. Systems come and systems go, but the Lord and his word, they abide forever. I'm on the winning side. Jesus is my captain. God is on his throne. It may look at times to us that there is chaos. It may look to us at times that there is conspiracy. It may look to us at times that there are people who are plotting and working against good things and truthful things. But let me be reminded and let me remind you of this, that there is a God who rules amongst the kingdoms of men. He sets up and he takes down. There is a God who has a plan. There is a God who is given to us that it, there is a, a desired end and that end will come as God has ordained and orchestrated it. God is in control. 
So in this, where they would push it back to Pilate and Pilate would push it back to them, in all of that, God says, I have a hand in this. I have a purpose in this. Now I want you to notice verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. Here's the picture. Here's Pilate. Pilate, who would rule in Israel for 10 years, we believe. Pilate, a historical figure. There are coins that you can purchase that have an image of Pilate stamped on them. Archaeology would tell us that there were those things that have been found in Jerusalem and around Israel and Galilee where there was a, an image that had been made of Pilate that had been broken, but the statue, the base of that is still there with Pilate's name. When somebody tries to tell you that Jesus did not exist, when somebody tries to tell you that the story of Christ in the Bible is falsehood, they are trying to pull the greatest scam ever over your eyes. They're just as rotten as those who would pay people off after the resurrection of Jesus to go and to promote a lie. The Bible is evidence of Christ. There's writing throughout history that evidences Christ. There are very things that people have found that are an evidence of Christ. And so these things happen. Pilate, a real man, living in real time, given a job from Rome. He's sitting on his seat in this judgment spot, ready to take on the day when somebody comes and they've sent this Jesus in. He said, what are you here for? Well, this crowd has brought him, and so he gets up, and he comes out to that crowd, and he says, okay, what do you want me to do with him? Why is he here? What's he guilty of? Well, we wouldn't have brought him to you if he wasn't a malefactor, if he wasn't somebody that deserves to be disciplined. Okay, what do you want me to do with him? We want you to put him to death. You put him to death according to your law. You take care of this. No, we want you to. And so Pilate walks back in. Who is Pilate? Pilate is a man subject to like passions as we are. Pilate has a family. Pilate has a job. Pilate has pressures. He has pressures from without. He has pressures from within. Let me speak to you for just a moment about this. Because Pilate will ask seven questions that I think are very important. There are seven questions that should be asked and be considered by all people. Consider the pressure of his family. Sometimes we read these stories about people and we think that they're just robots. And these things just happen. But that's not the case. He had a wife. His wife had had in a dream that this was a bad situation for Pilate, that he needed to, do, to be removed from this and get away from Jesus and get away from this situation. She sent a message to him and said, what? Do that. Get away from this. There was the pressure of family. There was the pressure of position. Hey, have you ever had a title or had a job or been responsible for something and all of a sudden you said to yourself, I really don't want to be responsible today. I had no idea when I was a child what it was like to not have responsibility. Right? Those of you that own businesses or those of you that have people that help you and you have to make decisions for them, are there ever times you said, man, I really wish somebody else would be responsible for that. I really wish somebody else would make that decision. But there's Pilate, a guy whose wife is going to tell him, stay away from this. Pilate, a guy who's sitting there in this spot that has been designated to him, and now it's been put on his plate to do something. I think if you could interview Pilate, Pilate might have said this, I don't want to deal with this today. This is not a good day for me. Come back another day. But here it is, Pilate. It's yours to deal with. Pressure of family. Pressure of position. Pressure of the world. You'll notice in chapter 19, that when the mob begins to twist Pilate's arm to do this, they say to him, if you don't do this, thou art not Caesar's friend. Caesar is a title for Roman emperor, king, captain, various things, but Caesar is that title given to the Roman emperor, the head dog, the head honcho. The crowd says to him, if you don't do what we asked you to do, you are not a friend of Caesar. You see, a little history about Caesar is this, that when he came in to be that person in Israel to kind of take charge and to keep things squelched, history would tell us that on a couple of occasions he had had uprisings. There was one time where he had had the bust of Caesar uh, in, in, carried on top of poles and he really wanted to make a statement about who he was and the strength that he had and what he was bringing to that area. And the people there rebelled against that. And so he called for a meeting kind of like a face-off and the face-off was going to be in an arena when it came to the arena, the people of Israel who had a problem with no images being made and graven images and were appealing to him in that capacity, they showed up with no weapons. And here he marched in with all of his soldiers with weapons and so it was a face-off of what are we going to do about this and he backed down on that. 
there was a problem with the water system and he took money from the temple, from their treasure, and he used that. And there was an uprising amongst the people that he had taken their treasury's money and used it to a better water system. This was all stuff that went back to his boss. And when his boss heard those things, what would you, if his job was to keep peace and he was not keeping peace, do you think that that might make him a little bit on edge? Absolutely. He's got the pressure of position. He's got the pressure of the world. Not only the world of Caesar and those from Rome who are questioning his ability, but he's also got the pressure of those that have brought these charges against Jesus Christ. The pressure of the world. And then there's a fourth pressure. And I use the word, maybe you would choose a different word, but I'll use this word if you'll allow it. That's the pressure of his conscience. Multiple times you'll see in this situation, they'll say, hey, I find no fault in this guy. If you would allow me to paraphrase this, say, listen, I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. You guys go and do it. I'm not going to, this guy's innocent. What's this guy done? Why are you treating him like this? This is wrong. Now look, Pilate is not doing that from the perspective that he's the Lamb of God. He's looking at it from strictly a natural man perspective that you're handling this person inappropriately, illegally, and you're wanting to drag me in through it. So Pilate enters back in and he asks Jesus some questions. Let's consider that first one, could we please? Then Pilate entered in, verse 33, judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou... The king of the Jews? Now contextually he's saying, are you the one that all the hubbub's been made about? Are you the one that the people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, our king has arrived? Are you that one? May I make application? Here's the question. Who are you? Who are you? Let me say something to you now. If you believe the Bible, then you understand that knowing who Jesus is, is of the utmost importance. Knowing who Jesus is, is of the utmost importance. Romans teaches us that creation reveals God to us. We see God in creation. You'd have to be a complete imbecile not to look up and see the order of the universe and the structure of the universe and not at least say, there is somebody greater than all of us that did this. I mean, this, this is not... By accident, this is all by design. Creation reveals that. The seasons and the structure of the seasons, they reveal that. The Word of God reveals Christ to us. And Christ, in turn, reveals God in a greater way to us. John chapter 3 is loved to be taken and quoted. John chapter 3 and verse 16, we see it in the end zone at football games. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a tremendous verse. But let's continue on, shall we? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be. Powerful verse. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Wonderful, wonderful. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is no asterisk next to that verse. That verse does not say he that believeth not is condemned already unless he grew up in a communist country where he was taught that there was no God. It does not say he is not condemned already if he grew up in another land where they had a different God. It doesn't say he's not condemned if he has a different opinion of this. No, friend, it's cut and tie. Who Jesus is is a foundational truth for salvation. We must believe that he entered into this world, that God came and dwelt amongst us, that God lived with man, that God came and in flesh he went to Calvary, Calvary, Calvarium, the skull, the place of the skull, where he died as an atonement for man's sins. Do you believe that book? That's absolute truth, isn't it? There's no gray area in that point right there. You either believe or you don't believe. How can they believe in whom they have not Heard, and how can they hear without a 
That's what we're called to do. That's why we're to take the gospel around the world to all countries where we don't want to offend them. We don't want to offend their culture with the gospel. We don't want to create problems. You see, that's the, that's the issue there. The gospel does create problems. This is what Jesus said. The gospel brings division. Because when confronted with this absolute truth that the only way to go from death unto life is to come through the one mediator, Jesus Christ, that does bring division. That smacks the self-righteous in the face. It smacks the religious in the face. It smacks the atheist in the face. And it says, you either come through Christ or you're condemned already. That's what the Bible teaches. We believe the Bible. We believe the Bible is the authority. It's the word of God. So when Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Who are you? Jesus in his day questioned his disciples. He says, whom do men say that I am? And some said, you're this person and that person. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who said, I know who you are. You're Christ. You're the son of God. You're the one that's come. And he said, hey, you got it right. You got it right. This is the truth. Notice the next question that's asked. Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, verse 34, Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Do you inquire for yourself, or are you simply looking to move this thing along? Are you sincere in your inquiry? How many people will travel through life? How many people will travel through life and never take that moment and allow the Lord and the Word of God and the lifted up Savior, the exalted Christ, to really seek out and to say, who is he? Who is he? Who is he? Could I make application this morning? It is not sufficient today that you're aware of Christ because of others in your life. It is not sufficient today that your only interest in Christ is appeasing the crowd, the pressure of family, the pressure of position, right? Those pressures, no sir. There needs to be a time in your life like the jailer who came to the end of his rope when he had heard all those things about the gospel and that evening as his world got shook up and turned upside down, he cried out, what must I do to be saved? Do you know Jesus? Who are you? Are you the king of the Jews? There's more that could be said there. Jesus answered saying, sayest thou this thing of thyself or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, look at his next question, the second question to Jesus. Am I a Jew? Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What is this mess to me? What is this to me? How does your situation, Christ, relate to me? Am I a Jew? Their issue with you seems to be a Jewish issue. They're the ones that have brought you. I didn't go and grab you. I didn't start this. They did. Am I a Jew that this should be my problem? Hey, let me remind you of something. The scripture speaks to this very clearly, that God is not a respecter of persons. God may have in his uh, counsel and determined his, his work in the in mankind, history of mankind, to have used Israel in a particular way, in a particular fashion, and a particular ministry with them. But that does not make us exempt from the things of God. Jew or Gentile, all need to know. All need to hear. All need to be clear and have understanding of who Jesus is. Am I a Jew? Now I want you to notice here, and I must wrap things up. Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Here, very quickly. Who are you? What's that to me? And what have you done? Who are you? What's that to me? And what have you done that would cause your own people, your own nation, to want you killed? And really, this is the questions, are they not? Who is Jesus? What's that to me? And what did he do? What did Jesus do that they would want and they would violate their own laws to bring him before Pilate, to push this on him? There's that mob outside wanting Pilate to act in such a way, to violate his own conscience, a pressure, a, a, such a way that his wife would say, stay away from this thing. What? Who am I to this? Why does this matter to me? And what have you done? Now I'm thankful today 
as the hymn writer wrote it, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. And I know who he is, and I know what it means to me, and I know what he did. He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. I know what he did. He went about doing good. I know what he did, and I know what he has done, and I know what he is doing. You see, he was asking in past tense, what have you done? But there was so much more to that question, wasn't there? Who is Jesus? Are you the king of the Jews? In a sense, but so much more than that. What is that to me? What does that matter? Maybe this morning you wonder, what, what does all this have to do with me? What does Jesus have to do with me? Jesus is God. God made you. Sin divided you from your creator. God came to this earth. He lived. He died. He rose again for you. What is this to you? It is God's means, God's plan for you to have redemption, for you to have the forgiveness of sins. It is pure. It is plain. And it is proclaimed right here. What should we do with this? Can you imagine that day, what must have been going through Pilate's head? Who is this guy that they are so stirred up that they will violate themselves, their rules, their order, their structure, to have him put to death? And I think that they're possibly at times in our lives looking upon Jesus and saying, well, what's this all about? Here's what this is all about. Christ came to save sinners. So faithful and worthy of all acceptation, Christ came into this world to save sinners. Jew, Gentile, regardless of the era that you lived in, we all need the same thing. We need Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. If you're here this morning and you do not know Christ as your Savior, consider those three questions. We'll cover the rest of them tonight. Number one, who are you? Number two, what is that to me? Number three, what have you done? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you now. We have proclaimed your word. We seek that your word would not return void. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. This morning we've spent some time here in study, a little different in our approach. But I would ask this morning, as sincerely and humbly as I can to you today, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know who he is? The Son of God. Do you know what that is to you? He's your Savior. Do you know what he did? He came to save sinners. If you're here this morning, you would say, Preacher, I do not understand that. I do not know that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I do not know that my sins have been forgiven. I have questions about those things. I have concerns about those things. You would say, Preacher, please pray for me. I'm seeking I'm seeking. I want to know more. I desire to know who he is and what it has to do with me and what he has done and what I'm to do with that. If you're here this morning, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We say, preacher, there, that's something in that for me. I don't know that I'm saved. Please pray for me, preacher. I don't know that I'm going to be in God's presence someday as the scripture promises the believer. Please pray for me, preacher. I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I see a hand. Who else would say this morning, preacher? I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Sometimes we'll ask this question this way. Do you know for sure if you're to die today, that heaven would be your home. Do you know that? Do you have that promise? If you say, preacher, I couldn't answer that. I don't really understand the question. Then let us help you. Sometimes we've got to go all the way back to the question before we can understand the answer. Sometimes we just travel through life. Perhaps Pilate had just traveling through life, going through things, and then all of a sudden he was confronted in that day with this question of who is Jesus? What's this got to do with me? And what in the world am I supposed to do with this situation? Who would say this morning, preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand? Who would say, preacher, I'm saved and I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Would you lift your hand with me today? I'm saved and I know, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Boy, am I. That's the truth. Let's just take a moment here for invitation. Maybe this is the call today. Maybe you have loved ones that you're praying for. Maybe you have loved ones that you want them to come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, who he is and what that means to them and what they need from him. Salvation only through him. Maybe you want to come today and lift that loved one up or a friend or neighbor. Perhaps today it's, even in our own lives, at times we can grow cold and indifferent towards Christ. But how powerful it is to hear this, his testimony. 
and what he faced and what he endured for us. However the Lord would lead you, I trust that you'll respond to him. Let's stand to our feet today. Our heads are bowed. Just to have a brief invitation here this morning. If you raised your hand or you did not, but you're there today and you say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Well, won't you let somebody show you today from God's word how you could be? In the book of Matthew, later on, Pilate will ask Matthew 27, verse 22, a question about what do you want me to do with Jesus? What would we like for you to do with him? We'd like for you to receive him. We'd like for you to know who he is and what that means to you. And we'd like for you to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ.